Uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, indeed, my name is Idris Munir Lalali. I'm the acting director of the African Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism and, and the moderator of today's session, uh, session two on challenges and opportunities to effective community policing in CVE. The objectives of, uh, of these sessions are to discuss the common barriers to the successful adoption of community policing in preventing and countering violent extremism, PCVE. Uh, it will be also to consider examples where community policing has contributed to uh, mitigating the threat of violent extremism. And then finally, to recommend concrete actions related to community policing that African nations uh, could take to improve their current uh, PCVE strategies. Uh, this session is therefore a continuation of session one uh, on approaches to community policing and CVE which outlined the basic principles and characteristic of community policing, discussed the benefit of community policing in preventing and countering violent extremism, and examined the strategies that exist to implement community policing approaches to PVE. The, um, the, the session or the exchanges during session one highlighted many important issues. Uh, among which police engagement with the public should be inclusive, reaching out to all communities and to across sections of members within communities, including at the grassroots level. They also the, the discussions also highlighted uh, to improve public perception and interaction with the police, you need public support for counterterrorism action of the police, which hinges on how the public perceives and interacts with the police. All members of the community, men and women, must believe that efforts to address their common and separate security concerns are genuine, that dialogue with the police is possible, and that their rights are respected before even we consider uh, participating or they consider participating in joint efforts. Public trust, therefore, in the police is not only a desired outcome of community policing, but also a precondition for its success. Uh, during the discussions, two major issues captured our attention, uh, namely the need to clarify what is meant by community policing, and second, how to situate the citizen as or at the center of community policing. Uh, concerning this last point, I am sure by the end of this program, you will be able, or at least you will become much more clear, or this will become much more clear how to situate the citizen within this whole idea of community policing. However, uh, before I introduce today's two speakers, I wish to recall what is meant, or at least give some clarity about what we mean by community policing. It's, it's quite simple. It refers to arrangements for policing that accord significant role to community in defining and guiding policing in the community. It's uh, a philosophy wherein the police and the community share resources and responsibility for solving recurring problems that directly or indirectly threaten uh, or impact the community's safety or livability. It is again about partnership, uh, to form a partnership with the community uh, in order to create a more secure and safe environment. It's the, the focus of this community policing is much more proactive crime prevention rather than emergency response. Uh, it therefore encourages the officers or the security uh, sector representatives to uh, see citizens and partners and vice versa. Uh, the ultimate objective is to see also the police and the security service uh, providers as partners to the community. It is therefore a flexible term referring to cooperative partnership between the community or its representative within the police or with the police, sorry, to solve identified problems that impact or interest them. So that's in short, or I hope I, I brought uh, uh, you know, a bit of clarity as to the, uh, uh, the concept of, of community policing uh, to help us move forward. As for today's session, we are very blessed, I must say, to have two very capable speakers that will share with us their experiences on today's topic of challenges and opportunities to effective community policing in CVE. Uh, we have with us in this session, uh, Ms. Jackie Mbogo, who is the chief of par uh, party of the Jama'i Tabiti, and I hope I pronounced it well in Swahili, program, which is helping Kenya's security services respond to crime conflict and violence, 
Jackie is currently leading a DFID funded police uh, reform program, which where Rusi is leading the CVE strand. We also have with us Mr. Faisal Bouchara, who is currently Commissioner General of Police First Degree. Prior to that, Mr. Bouchara was Senior Commissioner and Principal Commissioner in the Central Directorate of Counterterrorism in the Tunisian Ministry of Interior. Ranks he held for more than 10 years. Since 2018, Mr. Bouchard has also been a trainer specializing in counterterrorism in the Maghreb. Prior to that, he held the position of head of police officer within the Ministry of Interior, 1993 to 2004. Mr. Bouchara has also participated as a, uh, on a security study of foreign terrorism uh, or foreign combatant organized by the ITEC Center, uh, which is Tunisia Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, and this study uh, that uh, he participated in uh, took two years, 2016 to 2018. Mr. Bouchara speaks Arabic and, and French fluently. So uh, as, as we got accustomed with, uh, with the format, uh, it's gonna be a, a Q&A discussion uh, rather than formal presentations. So Jackie, let me, let me start with you. Uh, from your experience, uh, what are the common barriers to effective community policing? in preventing and countering violent extremism. I'm, I'm saying this in, in particular, um, you know, uh, those barriers that can complicate the cooperation and partnership and even undermine the whole idea of community policing. So over to you, Jackie. Thank you very much. And I must say, I am very delighted to be a speaker in this conversation today. It's very timely, it's very important and it denotes the very place where uh, success in countering violence extremism can be harnessed, which is with communities partnering with the police. And uh, Idris, as to say, you pronounce Swahili perfectly. <laughs> I think you're an original <laughs> uh, Swahili speaker. Uh, now, going to what you said, I want to take just a step back to what you actually uh, started by saying that the precondition for community policing and situating communities in community policing is trust. That denotes a lot of uh, you know, the complexity of community policing, but also its promise. So that where it functions, then we have to amplify the relational dynamic between the police and the community. And that of course must be grounded by trust. Uh, and of course, with trust comes the interdependent relationship and partnership between the two, the community and the police. Now, specific then to the question uh, you have raised, which is to discuss the barriers uh, to effective community policing in CVE. Uh, one of the things then I would actually uh, want to point out is the very essence of policing, because it doesn't happen in abstract. It must happen within a community, within a context, and it must be undergirded by a set of complex relationships between the communities and the police. These, com these relationships are actually shaped by the public view of safety and security. How do communities actually identify with safety and security? And this is uh, denoted by the public perception of the police the public perception of safety and security itself, do they actually feel safe? Do they feel not safe at all? Uh, it's also undergirded by the perceptions communities have of accountability and police behavior, including issues to do with corruption. So then specific to these barriers, I would say one of the biggest barriers is uh, uh, surrounded by the imbalance of approaches particularly where communities feel profiled by the police. If the police get into a community and the partnership is about profiling what you'd call problematic community, then obviously the trust is broken. Another issue is to do with the hist historical grievances that communities may hold with law enforcement. Where there has been systematic erosion of trust, that communities view the police either as preserving the state or a political regime, where communities feel that uh, you know, the police have been used to meet out brutality and therefore trust has eroded over time. 
it is very difficult then for community policy to take root. There's an issue uh, thirdly to do with the negative perceptions and experiences communities have had with law enforcement. For example, where there's been extrajudicial killing, where there's been abuse of power and excessive force, including illegal detentions, then obviously that barrier to trust does happen and meaningful participation cannot happen. Of specific to CVE, I would like to point out the need or the absence of linking uh, community policing CVE responses to broader safety and security concern so that if community policing is only to weed out uh, you know, persons considered problematic or identified as potential risk for CVE, that cannot happen because communities want to situate the relationship to addressing the broader safety and security concerns. Uh, of course, there are also issues to do with, uh, you know, limited uh, investment in uh, social investment between the police and the community. And this in itself undergirds a lot of issues to do with conflicting values, whether they are social or cultural values, as long as there are conflicting values between the police and the community, social and cultural and religious values, then you're going to find that that in itself, the relationship cannot work. And finally, uh, so that maybe you take on the next speaker, is the whole question of extractive relationships. If communities feel that the relationship is about extracting from uh, information from them, extracting uh, problematic persons from them, that relationship cannot work. And yet a lot of time you find community policing being framed around extracting information from communities. As long as that happens and the philosophy is tied to just information uh, management and harvesting, then you find the positioning of community policing and the approach becomes very problematic even where communities may be well-meaning or even where police themselves may be well-meaning. So that is an area to really address in terms of the barriers. Thank you and over to you, Idris. Thank you, Jackie. Very, very valid points. You know, I've been taking notes all along. And, uh, and indeed, uh, these are some of the major challenges and, and barriers that come in the way of, of proper community policing. And, and I think, as you said, it's the historic interaction or experience that the community had with the police uh, is one of the major ones. And then the, the perception that one has to, uh, to, to, to uh, really address uh, in order to have a beneficial and meaning relationship. Uh, let, me, let me turn now to, uh, to Faisal. Uh, so Faisal, um, uh, um, what are the good practices and lessons learned by law enforcement in Tunisia in engaging communities to create resilient and preventing uh, and countering violent extremism and terrorism? Thank you. I am delighted to be with you today. I would like to speak of community policing and the opportunities it brings. And I'm going to speak of the Tunisian experience that put into place community policing in Tunisia. The, um, we used, uh, it, as part of the process of democratization, we have changed the laws and the Tunisian government, uh, along with the uh, help of the United Nations, put into place with the uh, Minister of the Interior uh, the opportunity to put into place the reforms and around 2013. They signed a document to support this to prevent and to respond to the crisis that we had in Tunisia, which was a set, an ensemble of, of reforms. We were seeking to, uh, to speak to the framework, uh, the cap capabilities of the key institutions, the management and use of shared information and knowledge, and you, the use of civil society. Uh, 
in doing so, we did, we chose to choose community policing to do this. If we compare the mechanisms of traditional policing and community policing, we can see that traditional policing depends, uh, is a repressive mechanism and usually resides on uh, reactions, whereas community policing is transparent and is a partnership with society and is focused more on preventing crime. And this is why Tunisia put together a model for community policing. And this also allows us to establish a solid setting and relationship between the community and the police and which will uh, which allows to establish and to assure a good exchange of information it also put in place a new approach to apply in general all the parts all the all the different parts of society to be inclusive, to have an interactive partnership and a relation based in trust. As my colleague said, trust is so important. So the good practices uh, to counter violent extremism must be based on prevention as we see to counter radicalization. So tra the traditional policing is not sufficient. A teacher, so unlike a police officer, on a daily basis works with uh, students. It's a better place uh, to find changes amongst uh, vulnerable youth. And the agents of the state, uh, social affairs, uh, member, active members of social society are in permanent contact with uh, different families and can participate in a direct manner fighting terrorism and violent extremism. The use of uh, human resources remains essential to reach and to implement a successful model of uh, community policing via intelligence and go beyond uh, the customary uh, difficulties. Uh, Prevention enables us to identify clearly threats as well as uh, the level of uh, threat that they represent and to analyze uh, these changes. Uh, when uh, thwarting terrorism, you use uh, the forces of security and you can discover signs of uh, violent radicalization and it's a better opportunity to inform and uh, community intelligence when it comes to counterterrorism. These last few years, uh, Tunisia had to face uh, a, this uh, threat of uh, violent extremism, which and affect um, the political process and uh, economic and the economic process. So we had to face a number of th terrorist attacks. So we had to approach, uh, resort to these uh, techniques. Um, a number of uh, Tunisian citizens participated and uh, they were part um, of violent extremist groups, uh, these transnational groups, uh, in zones of conflicts. In 2016, we adopted a national strategy to fight terrorism, which integrates prevention. And uh, there's, we have protection, investigation, action, and a national commission to fight terrorism was created in 2015. The Tunisian experience has demonstrated that this reactive uh, and the security approach alone cannot uh, face uh, this uh, scourge. Other preventive uh, measures have to be adopted. Uh, getting on board all the different actors at a local and national level to uh, 
thwart um, these uh, drifts. Thank you. So specifically, we want to know the techniques. Ah, les techniques. Yes. Okay. Dans le cadre de la relance de la police de proximité, comme j'ai déjà dit, une série d'activités ont été mises en place pour avoir de régler. We have to settle some of the main struggles. We have to define our community policing, identify the different actions, uh, different organizations that contribute to the success of this model, identify and uh, train within our security forces, special agents. That's very important uh, that uh, police officers uh, have the wherewithal and participate in this change. They will support uh, these uh, changes within the police force and we have to have a ministerial policy to guarantee the success of the implementation of this community policing amongst uh, the recommendations of the ministry in terms of uh, execution. First of all, in uh, the, we have uh, 10 uh, pilot uh, precincts that support uh, the interior ministry to support uh, community po policing. And we have this um, system for complaints and tools were adopted. A new dashboard was, has been deployed within uh, these pil pilot uh, precincts and a po policy of uh, inspection. Uh, we want to set up a curriculum and the execution was at uh, the level of uh, the national government through 10 precincts located in nine um, governorships, uh, which represents the north, the center, and the south of two Tunisia. The reality of these uh, precincts these po and the benefits of uh, reinforcing uh, management and helping decision we built uh, centers to simulate, to train. We have four schools now, and and this we have uh, trained 210 officers uh, per year. The new policy also made sure to modernize the inspection system, the control, the monitoring system, the implementation of a c code of conduct the use of a reference document, which is unified for p community policing and the realization of a legal framework. It's very important for community policing in Tunisia. Also, we're in implementing uh, centers to train with simulations and the other schools to train police officers, the definition of a reference model. The Ministry of Interior is making progress in uh, the generalization of this approach at a regional level on a pilot uh, basis, but also in the south with a rehabilitation of uh, six uh, precincts and the implementation of uh, six local committees for security before applying this th throughout uh, the territory. This uh, phase of gradual generalization will go soon beyond the national level through the integration of uh, the training of agents uh, in terms of uh, the different um, training schools. The, we've uh, reached a satisfactory results um, in the different pilot localities and this indicates uh, an important reduction of crime, namely terrorism, uh, satisfying the citizens in terms of the uh, security and administrative uh, dynamics. We want to show the project and, um, the, and the, uh, the different uh, achievements uh, we've uh, realized. And we want to favor exchanges with other countries that have de developed uh, similar systems. Uh, 
we are at an advanced stage in this implementation. This ex experience has reduced crime in several locations with a huge uh, improvement and uh, the citizens are very happy by the interior security forces. We want to pursue efforts of this reform of security and the involvement of uh, community policing, which requires a quick procedure to uh, impl implement this at a national level. Thank you. You know, Jackie, now that we learned and uh, from the Tunisian experience in terms of the techniques that are useful for law enforcement uh, in order to engage uh, effectively and efficiently with the communities, uh, based on your work in Kenya, which techniques are useful for law enforcement in engaging with young people, uh, women, uh, faith-based organizations and religious leaders? ethnic minorities and civil society organizations. This is quite important because, you know, usually the stakeholders, and I would even call them clients within a community, they're not all homogeneous. So it would be quite interesting to, uh, to look at it from your perspective and, uh, and, and, and enlighten us and share with us some of your insight. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, communities are not homogeneous. So, uh, but however, um, there are strategies that we have used and can continue to be used that, uh, uh, you know, identify the unique needs of specific sectors of community, but at the same time, can consider them as part of a broader community. Uh, because our learning is also that uh, as much as you focus on one group, uh, for example, the youth, you may also inadvertently seclude or, or begin to isolate other sectors of community if you don't also take a strategy that locates youth and their special needs within a broader community. That said, I'll just share a few strategies we've used. Uh, one would be what I would call a broad-based approach, for example, where we have entered the community policing and CV discourse through the uh, other discourses, for example, the peace sector engagement. We have uh, a lot of peace uh, forums and Kenya is known for uh, the peace committee uh, approach. And so with a broad-based approach, you locate uh, the unique needs of specific groups within a bigger framework of engagement, for example, through the peace sector, which ensures that youth or women who participate in peace committees, for example, can be identified and can partner and participate in community policing efforts through a neutral platform that does not begin to, uh, first of all, make them look like they are, uh, you know, special cases for the police or are not targeted by the very community that begins to feel you are an enemy for uh, engaging with the police or you actually the informer of, of that community. A broad-based approach also means, for example, you're able to engage with uh, youth or even women or special groups uh, through um, other criminal justice routes. Uh, for example, where a diversion is required uh, because somebody has been in conflict with the law, you're able to target such a person, you're able to engage with them, you're able to convert them to engaging with the police, especially where police have allowed a creative solution, like I said, through diversion uh, tactics. Uh, we also have uh, uh, another example of where you engage uh, through uh, targeted intervention, uh, particularly that are solving problems of that particular niche uh, community or population. Uh, I'll give an example of women. Uh, one of the most a winning approach has been to target women through enhancing GBV response. So we have something we call polycare. We also have gender desks where police can offer good and qualified services to women as a way of building trust to women 
And which then means when you move away from that service model, women continue to trust the police because we are given good services and services that are very responsive to their unique needs, uh, particularly when addressing GBV. The same has been used, uh, again, a, a good example has been a school-based model where we have uh, uh, safe boxes uh, where children in school can be targeted by law enforcement for partnership and they are able to use safe boxes to drop, uh, you know, uh, listening boxes or safe boxes where police officers can engage with the children to hear cases, which include, of course, a partnering to look at uh, you know, addressing very specific school-based needs. And we know for CV that is important because the education sector is also very, very key in enhancing a response framework uh, for children and building their competencies and capacity to understand the need for prevention. Uh, there are also sector-specific models. For example, uh, in, in communities such as uh, Northeastern Kenya in Garissa, and, and Isiolo, where uh, the police have been engaged in the religious forums, madrasas and church services to promote a preventive approach to also begin to understand a doctrinal understanding of prevention and the place of doctrine in promoting prevention. Now, with that kind of an approach, you find it is promising because the police begin to come to the level of the community begin to walk in the spaces uh, and spiritual uh, level where communities are at so they are able then to uh, you know response uh, to respond better they are also able to appreciate the unique challenges and unique needs of those communities uh, there there is also a model of uh, specifically addressing partnership with high risk population now, this, of course, does not say we profile communities, but it looks at a needs-based approach where you say we have youth is a high-risk population uh, for recruitment, for example. And how do you then address this specific need? You then tailor make a policing engagement and partnership specific to that high risk population where they are located. A good example is in Kenya, you will find that the young people tend to hang out in car wash areas and uh, social amenities where they are playing games, there are video clubs where they are watching videos or they are shooting pool, you know, a game. And, and so, by engaging through a high risk population model, then the police begin to engage with the youth who are in a car wash area or in a video den to have conversations and discussions around other topical issues, not necessarily CV related, but issues that uh, you know, uh, trouble the, this particular population. And out of it, you're able to design an approach to response. Uh, there is, uh, of course, an approach around, uh, you know, which spans multiple communities. And in that kind of an approach, you are taking youth or women, for example, as part of a big community and through uh, applying, for example, um, creative solutions, you're making sure that community policing forums or committees are representative, uh, are represented by women uh, they have youth representation in them. So what that then means is though you're taking them as one whole community within that sitting, you're being very clear that youth must be there, women must be there, they must sit in the committees and not only sit in the committees, but they're also given special roles, specific roles, like to be a, a leader of a committee, to be a secretary of a committee and not relegating them to just hearing the proceeding, but they are taking an active leadership role. With that kind of an approach, what we have learned is then you begin to see women and youth or faith leaders not as uh, you know, uh, a removed 
uh, population, but a population that is within a bigger population, but their specific needs are also being met within uh, you know, the, the specific setup. So those would be some of the approaches that have been taken. Then finally, I, I want to highlight Though it is not a specific, uh, you know, um, method approach, it's a method of engagement where you locate specific officers that uh, that that represent the unique needs of that population. A good example is where you hire younger officers to work with young people. When you do that, they will speak the same language they will speak the same and when i say language i'm not saying meaning a demographic uh, i'm not meaning uh, um, a regional language in this case they are speaking a demographic language because young people tend to speak a unique language which is specific to young people whether it is a sheng in kenya which is a you know a, a young version of swahili or they're speaking English in a manner that is the same and unique to that, uh, to that demographic. So you hire officers that can fit that demography. You hire young officers and situate them with young people. You get female officers situated in places where you want to reach out to young, uh, you, you know, to women. With that kind of an approach, what you, what you see is that then women will put their guard down, they'll tend to relax around a female officer much more than they would relax around a male officer or an older male officer. You will find young people will tend to gravitate more towards a younger officer than when they are seen within an old, they are they are partnering with an older officer so again that method of working means you're not only culturally sensitive but also you're demographically sensitive so that these the unique needs of these communities and demographies can 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 be appreciated in whatever approach of community policing your 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 your, your building now to underscore in all the methods you take trust is key and every of these unique groups comes with a set of trust challenges. If it's women, the approach you take, you must ensure that first you're building it against the basis of their, their, their method of building trust. How do women build trust? They are socialized to be together as a group. So how do you become part of this group and build on that uh, you know, platform of socialization so that you can then uh, obviously fit in and be sensitive to their needs. Then for young people, it's also appreciating and understanding uh, issues of language, the language you use to communicate, issues again of trust, where they are found, the issues that the young people will grapple with are not necessarily even policing in nature, but they contribute to law and order. There are issues to do with uh, engagement, for example, the lack of employment and how do police respond to that in terms of the engagement. And that's not to say that the police become a social worker, but they must be constructed to be able to appreciate the unique needs, the unique challenges, because once they understand the unique challenges, then trust is built. For religious sector, doctrine is very important. And what I've seen is, and the examples I gave, for example, in working, uh, police beginning to work in mad uh, madrasas or getting involved in understanding uh, what happens uh, in, 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 in the religious circle is very, very important because they begin to understand the doctrinal uh, underpinnings of engagement. As long as you're blind to the realities of religion within a certain group, the intra-religious dynamics and inter-religious dynamics, then of course you cannot be able to fortify trust. Because like I said, the most important thing is to build that relationship from the perspective of trust. And so in Kenya, where it has worked is where both police and communities have grounded the relationship in trust building. Unfortunately, very few police cultures and institutions are resourcing trust building. 
So I would like to underscore here that perhaps the most important thing we need to be asking ourselves is how do you resource trust building? It cannot happen overnight. It cannot happen because you met community once or you speak the language of that community. It's deeper than that. It has to have cultural nuance. It has to have religious uh, nuance. It has to have research in it. It has to have a lot of accommodation and the willingness to walk in the space of those communities. I, I think that that's what I would say, Idris, and uh, over to you. Happy to expound even more when we get to the question and answer session. No, definitely I'm gonna jump back again right now and continue with you uh, because you know a few things came to mind, uh, in, in, in particular when you're talking about trust building, uh, the demographics, the language, the calibrating the message to the audience, uh, the public service that the police needs to uh, to focus on much more than you know uh, much more than the uh, let's just say applying security and giving the oppression of oppressors, not serving the communities. I think. Uh, um, you know, this goes back again to one of the points that uh, Faisal has uh, has uh, focused on is is the training, is the uh, maybe the structural organiz organizational changes uh, that need to occur within the mindset and the, uh, within the law enforcement and security agencies. So my question would be, uh, you know, a follow-up question to what you've been uh, saying, um, Jackie. What are the structural and organizational changes that are needed to occur in security agencies for community policing to work effectively? Uh, thank you, Idris. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the biggest structural change that must happen is the very structure of the traditional view of law enforcement. See, the police uh, formally are trained and, and of course socialized to be a bureaucracy that works within the prisms of maintaining law and order. So that, that construction and means that the police then need to appear tough on crime, but relationship cannot be built where one party feels we are being tough on crime against you. The we versus you mentality that comes with that bureaucracy in and of itself must be addressed for, for, for that relationship to happen and the structure of trust to be built. That's not to say that police must look the other side when crime happens, no. It just simply means we must apply another lens to understanding communities, to even understand why crime happens in the first place. You're not coming in just because you know, your, your crime has happened, we are arresting all of you, we are beating all of you, but beginning to understand what is underpinning this crime dynamics in this community? How else can I reach to the heart of this community? Are they inherently evil or are there circumstances that we need to be addressing to resolve this issue? And once you begin to get there, you realize that there's a shared then responsibility because communities begin to gravitate to solutions. As long as uh, law enforcement is not bringing solutions, it's coming to punish, that becomes a problem. So again, reorienting that punishment perspective, that police only come to punish they don't come to provide a solution. That must be addressed for we to be able to address those structural gaps. There, there are issues to do with cultural dynamics. And when I say cultural dynamics, I'm talking of institutional cultures. You find that the institutional culture of the police can be very rigid, rigid to creating solutions rigidity to, 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 to change, where there's resistance to change towards community, towards appreciating communities. Now, as long as the police continue to appear as tough-minded, that means that culture cannot allow for creative solutions. And community engagement, building trust, honestly, is not a textbook affair 
it is not, uh, you know, something you go to the lab and, uh, uh, you know, put together and uh, voila, you have a solution. It actually happens where creativity of solutions can be found and that cannot happen in a culture which, uh, you know, undermines uh, or resists uh, any form of uh, autonomy of decision making, any form of, uh, you know, um, creativity within officers. There are issues to do, of course, with uh, the political capture and the capture of interest by political class. Now, as long as police, like I said before, there is the traditional view that police only serve to perpetuate uh, you know, the, the state or to perpetuate the interests of one group against the other, in which, in which case you could look at the political class. Now, if there's that capture of the police ambition, of the police thinking, of police culture by a political interest, then obviously trust cannot happen. And because even where police engage with communities, they are going to engage from the perspective of, I want to preserve. The, the political interest. And believe you me, Idris, communities get that. Communities know it. Communities can smell it when that happens. So of course, authenticity is eroded. And the minute, of course, any relationship that is not authentic cannot mature and cannot, uh, of course, grow. And uh, uh, as I hand back to you, there's also the issue of then, of course, the challenge of transparency, the brotherhood culture. You see, as long as the, the police act as a club, as a brotherhood where accountability and transparency cannot be questioned, so that if an officer commits an offense against a community, the, the entire service will come to protect or cover that officer, then that relationship cannot happen because the reverse is not true for communities. When a community member commits an offense, you'll find community members willing to volunteer that person, willing to expose that person. Now, the corresponding reality is that must also happen with the police for there to be a sense of true and genuine commitment. For the young people, for example, if they see that an officer who, for example, used excessive force, nothing has happened to that officer, he continues to probably uh, roam the street and police them. What do you think happens? They begin to feel there's a brotherhood happening with the police and therefore let us also make our own brotherhood and that brotherhood should be to limit engagement with the police. So it becomes counteractive. And so for me, I would think if we can ground the relationship on transparency and genuine transparency, then it is possible to happen. But unfortunately, where it doesn't happen or where there's no transparency, then that relationship is unlikely to, to grow. Thank you and back to you, Idris. No, this is, this is quite uh, enlightening and, and, and very, uh, very um, powerful what you're saying. And indeed, one has to look at, you know, this partnership as any relationship. It takes time. Uh, it takes, uh, you know, uh, as we say, trust is a luxury. It, it needs to be earned. It's not given. And in particular, when it comes to this, uh, you know, interaction and very difficult, I would just say, relationship between the police and the communities, uh, you know, based on bad experiences, as you're saying, and preconceived ideas on both sides. So it, uh, it will take some efforts. It will take some time. So I, I think the, uh, the, this calls for creativity and innovation, you know, the different uh, approaches and different examples that you stated, I think, are venues to explore. Uh, by those that are, um, you know, in a position to be able to uh, to 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 put uh, uh, on its feet, you know, a program of community policing. So uh, it, it's quite important. But we have to, you know, uh, remember that it takes time. Uh, we shouldn't give up at the, you know, at the first setback. Uh, but we have to act responsibly. Um, and I think, as as you indicated clearly, uh, there is a need to sit down with the communities and start addressing their serious and uh, I think priority concerns. Uh, that's uh, also a venue that one can explore, uh, and then have the police now focus on those priority security areas that are not necessarily linked to CVE, uh, but could contribute 
to the actions that could be undertaken under PCVE uh, at a later stage. Uh, Faisal, let me end with you. Uh, and I think this is my last question because I think we, uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, we're giving sufficient time to participants to, uh, to ask questions. So Faisal, let me ask you a final question. Uh, what helps foster the effective exchange of information between security actors and communities, you know, based on uh, your, uh, your, your experience in Tunisia? So, what uh, favorizes uh, the exchange of information between uh, the community and social civil society and police? The action plan uh, that Tunisia has to 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 prevent crime uh, in general is not only for extreme uh, extremism and anti-terrorism, they're based in security, but also in preventive actions um, concerning the fight against extremism. So we, this, our program is, uh, has four main pillars we have to each person has to be conscious of their own role in the security of a region and a resolution of problems uh, by I, by early identification of problem sources communication and transparency are the main mechanisms between the security forces and so civil society and to um, assure that the population um, is familiar that there's communication between the two. So this implies that civil society, the population and all of the um, all of the actors uh, of this so civil society, the National Guard, the police, the uh, civil authorities, all of the key actors uh, can organize uh, regular meetings to, to meet and address the problems of the region. We also put into place uh, the police, the National Guard, uh, an, a, a, an office for, of, of, uh, of community relations but to handle the problems to speak directly with citizens. And this has much improved relations between the police and citizens. We also have put into place a reception uh, desk uh, uh, office so that citizens in the um, police stations can come to the police station, uh, can uh, be well received, and, um, and if they have a complaint to make, they can do so. And we also work on modernizing the system for citizens to place complaints. Sometimes uh, people are put in positions, uh, some people go to, some people go to the police station or to to some people when they when they meet together at the police station it can create difficulties to be seen uh to be seen speaking uh to the police so it as i said it's very important to have trust also we use we use polls uh to find out how people are feeling and to meet our goals. So what has been accomplished also? There was a series of activities that were put into place. To put into place community policing, we had some pilot projects um, that we have used throughout Tunisia in the pilot program. So we have 
four of, four of these pilot programs that are part of the National Guard as well. And if you look at the map of Tunisia, you can see how these uh, pilot um, police stations, are, where they're located, these have allowed more favorable exchanges between uh, security forces and the community. The, uh, the acts that were adopted by the ministry to increase partnership between people, uh, civilians and police, uh, took into account uh, the uh, population's concerns and they considered uh, the, the relations between the police and the population. They, they are encouraging a participatory approach because in Tunisia we have the police that is in the uh, in the in the cities, and then we have the national guard that is located in areas that that are near the borders. For example, the interior minister put into place uh, a new approach regarding uh, security relations with citizens. These thoughts came from a study and it led to the creation, the adoption of a Tunisian model for the police. One example that pertains to the activities of community community policing. I already mentioned in my presentation, in the case of the, it was a, a fair, a community affair that uh, in the village or the town in the, in, or we had also some workshops or we had sports events that were organized between the community and the local security actors to reinforce um, trust to, to put into place of resilience of this relation. And in my presentation, um, I have shown this. And among the youth in Tunisia, in, uh, in areas of conflict, we also put into, we also have a program that in which many people have participated. In 2019, the United Nations Program for Development in Tunisia supported the Ministry of the Interior on a project. Uh, this ministry started a program called Preventing Extreme Violence Using Community Policing. And this program is in the southeast part of the country in the near the border. And with uh, logistical uh, support, the two police stations and the Gar National Guard in two different towns were able to work together. In Burgadan. Burgadan, as you know, is a, is a town from uh, the Bignin governorship, 30 kilometers away from uh, the Libyan border. And uh, 7 March uh, 2016, dozens of jihadists uh, attacked the uh, military barracks and uh, the police station of the National Guard. The purpose of this operation is to rally the town to the Islamic State and, and to create an, an emirate. Um, and despite the fact that uh, terrorists uh, launched attack the inhabitants, they are against the army and the police. Uh, they do not target actually common citizens, but uh, the civil society and the citizens uh, joined um, side by side all the national units to prevent this operation and to abort it. In uh, that operation, uh, there were martyrs. Uh, 19 police officers died and seven civilians, and we eliminated 36 terrorists 
and seven terrorists were arrested. Uh, obviously, one of the essential causes of this uh, position of the citizens uh, was this policy, the, the mechanism for community police, police uh, in this area. And thank you for your attention. Uh, well, thank both of you. Uh, this has been a very uh, enriching uh, session, I must say, at least from my point of view, I've been taking notes since the beginning. Um, and I think the participants um, also have found it very interesting to hear both of your experiences and, uh, and, and really listen to um, you know, uh, the answers that you were giving to some of the questions that I'm sure um, they had in the back of their minds.